Okay. Show slide. Here we go. Okay, so we're sort of finishing the Middle Ages. We started last time, or we ended last time talking about the Middle Ages. This is the period 500 to 1000. And we talked, of course, we've already covered uh, the Greco Roman tradition, the Judeo Christian tradition. We really mentioned that these three, uh, the Middle Ages really is a combination of three different things. Thank you. Let me repeat that again. <laughs> I lost my microphone. Uh, we're looking at the uh, early Middle Ages, 500 to 1000. And we've said that really this was an, the culmination of three different groups or organizations, cultures really, that were existing at that time. The Greco-Roman culture, and we identified a number of things that came out of Greece and Rome, both that were incredibly influential in terms of the humanities. And we really said that modern humanities really began in Greece. But we also looked at the Judeo-Christian tradition. We looked at the emergence of the four major religions that happened at this time as well. And the thing we're going to talk about right now is sort of the Germanic influence. Because what's happening up in Northern Europe? What's happening up in what is today Britain and Scandinavia and those kinds of things? So we need to understand that a little bit. Uh, the Catholic Church, we, we mentioned the emergence of Christianity, and it has, has really uh, developed and spread. It's uh, become a major force, really, in shaping culture in Western Europe. Uh, it goes up into, uh, in fact, all the way into Britain. The, uh, the, the uh, Roman culture extends that far, and then with it, then the, uh, uh, what they call the Holy Roman Empire, which we'll talk about in a minute, extends into that uh, part as well. But what we have happening in Northern Europe, basically in the Germanic countries, is a system that is a feudal system, a system based on manors, manors being uh, large estates. Um, and so you have feudal lords that are ruling, and you have a variety of tribes and things that are happening um, at this time as well. So we have a little bit different kind of a thing that's happening in this period of time. Remember we mentioned that some people talk about this as sort of the Dark Ages, uh, because the, the classicism of, of uh, Greece and Rome are not felt up into these areas. But we do have a tremendous uh, population explosion that happens. Between 700 and 1300, uh, the population of Europe uh, really blooms from 27 million to 73 million, almost triples in size in that time period. Uh, and it's a huge growth period. And as you can imagine, then with that growth, of course, come some changes in society and culture and those kinds of things. Um, basically, then, what's happening in Northern Europe, uh, we have a system of chieftains that are ruling, the chieftains that are kind of running the show here. And you have a, a lots of different pe groups of people. You have the Franks, uh, you know, you have the Anglo-Saxons, you have the Picts, if you remember some of your... Um, Western civilization or history, you remember some of these groups. And they create a system that's really based on common law, really the existence of tradition and, and custom that's been passed down um, through their generations anyway. And you have this uh, series of uh, sort of a common law thing that occurs. Um, and of course we have, today we have uh, issues of common law that's really borrowed from this um, early uh, Germanic influence. The literature that's produced, and there are a couple outstanding things, some of these you may be familiar with, uh, oftentimes um, uh, parts of these or some of these things are, are taught in the high schools too. But the literature includes a, a mythological component to it, um, and you have the famous uh, epic poems and stories like Beowulf. Uh, you have stories, the Song of the Nibelung, which is the, the Ring trilogy, which later becomes a popular science fiction work, by Tolkien, but it's based on this old Germanic story. And the Song of Roland as well, all dealing with knights. These are heroes. Uh, they're similar to the sort of the Greek uh, poems, you know, the Iliad and the Odyssey, in that they have heroes that go out and do battle and um, slay dragons and slay different things and so forth. And um, so you have some similarities in terms of how those stories work. Uh, this map gives you sort of an idea of of what it looks like. Um, this red area here is what is known as the Eastern Roman Empire. Rome has really ex expanded its influence. Christianity is felt throughout the world. But this is what is considered the Eastern Roman Empire. 
and you can see Constantinople is there, which is one of the um, leading areas of Christianity in the East. And this area is the Roman Empire, Western Roman Empire. And you can see that it extends out of Italy and, and Rome, of course, all the way up into Britain and all the way down into Africa. So it's a really a huge area that's influenced by uh, the Roman Church. But in the meantime, you have the, all these other groups. And you can see some of the names, the Visigoths, the Vandals, uh, the Ostrogoths. You get a number of these groups, these tribes that I'm talking about that are also living and, of course, have a culture. And they have humanistic things happening there as well. Perhaps one of the greatest of these uh, leaders would be Charlemagne. Uh, he's a Frank, a Frankish leader. And he's the one who really brings, in a sense, Christianity into these northern areas, into these Germanic areas. He's really sort of credited with spreading the idea of uh, Christianity. So the Holy Roman Empire is largely a result of Charlemagne. Uh, he's a man that's also interested in the arts and humanities, and he develops an education system. Um, and it really sort of creates the first, if you want to call it a mini renaissance. I mean, it's not the, the big renaissance, which we'll end up talking he about here at the end. But it's a, it's a, it's a renaissance in the, in the sense that it fuses the Germanic traditions and customs with the Roman ideas, with the Byzantine ideas. The Byzantine ideas are those things in the Far East. So he kind of combines all those things and really does create a huge empire, really sort of unifying these things. Um, Renaissance, as you know, means what? A rebirth, yeah. So it's a rebirth of an interest in uh, classical things, education, the humanities, as we call them, the different arts and things. And he really fosters that. So in many ways, um, he, he becomes a tremendous unifier. And a Charlemagne, as we know him today, is the French word for Charles the Great One. Uh, this is sort of the translation here. Now, the sort of the sad thing of this whole <laughs> experience is it really is sort of short-lived. As you can see here, Charlemagne's rule is only 768 to 814. And um, historians would say that in many ways uh, he was very dictatorial, even though a lot of what he did were, were good things. It was basically a, a dictatorship. And the problem with that is when he was gone, there was no system, there was no leaders uh, to sort of follow in his wake. There was no one to kind of pick up the slack. So basically when, when Charlemagne is gone, uh, we again sort of, we don't have a continuation of some of those things that happen. Um, some of the uh, uh, influence that the Germanic tribes and, and uh, Charlemagne has on the humanities includes literature. We mentioned the Song of Roland is one of those, like Beowulf and so forth, that really deals with the, the warfare of the time. It talks about uh, the culture of war that is existing, where you have these warlords uh, sort of fighting one another to gain territory. Um, you have uh, tapestries that are woven, unlike the Greeks, of course, who are creating marble statues and are creating large edifices and things. The arts in the Germanic countries are primarily arts based on the materials that they have at hand. And the materials that they have at hand are natural materials. They can get wool from their sheep, for example, to create uh, cloth. And so a lot of the art they have are sort of what we consider today almost craft-based. I mean, they're tapestries, they're, they're rugs, they're those kinds of things. And, of course, they have other sort of um, uh, daily kinds of things that you would use, like uh, chalices, glasses, plates, and those kinds of things, the silverware, as we call it, all become part of the arts that they develop, that they, they make their own stamp on those things. And, of course, the tools of, of warfare, the swords, uh, you know, weapons, and the, all those kinds of things. But they do develop some new things which are interesting. Uh, we do begin to see an interest in what is called illumination. That's this technique of sort of highlighting uh, text with pictures. It's sort of the first examples of illustrations. We might think of it that way in terms of uh, of modern illustrations, uh, where they take a look at their Christian documents, their Bibles and other kinds of things, and they, they illustrate them using the, the fancy calligraphy, but also the artwork that goes along with that. You also have, in terms of music, uh, it's still primarily um, <coughs> religious-based, 
But you have a, a, a new type of music, the Gregorian chant, which is coming out of the devotion. Again, it's uh, influenced by the, uh, the Christian influence here. But it's something that provides then uh, a music that goes along with sort of spreading the idea of Christianity as well. Uh, so here you have an example of, a, of an illustration from a page in the Bible. And up in the top, you see a, just a small piece of a tapestry from this period. And this is a huge tapestry, that, which really tells the uh, several battles. But the most famous one is the Battles of Hastings at this time. But this tapestry, if you can imagine, is 231 feet long. So it's this huge tapestry. It's about three or four feet wide this way, but 231 feet long. And uh, it, it basically tells the story of uh, this, this time period. So you have uh, depictions of the, the uh, feudal system with knights, so you have castles, and uh, this is sort of the period we're talking about. Song of Roland, as we said, is a sort of a heroic epic. And again, you, in this cover of a, of a book of it, you can see again sort of the armor. Uh, th this is typically what we think of when we think of the Middle Ages or medieval period. We think of knights and we think of this, this type of a thing. And that's what's happening here. This is the Germanic influence. Uh, other things that go along with the, the German arts and, and humanities at this time are interest in jewelry. As we mentioned, tapestry, carpets, things like that. Uh, they begin to use some new techniques uh, in their artistry. Uh, Cloison and the cruciform are two different examples. I think I have some pictures here. And as you might imagine, architecture uh, continues to include uh, churches, but castles now, fortifications, uh, because there these uh, different tribes are trying to protect themselves from one another. Here you have an example of a chalice that's ornately decorated. This again would be typical of sort of the art that's happening in this time period. Uh, this is an example of a cloisonne. Does anyone know what cloisonne is? What that, what, how, how this is created? Um, it's, it's a very delicate type of art, and it's, it's a little difficult to see here, but what you have is melted glass. They melt glass down, so you have these different colors of liquid that's poured into a sort of a, uh, a mold, if you want to call it that, but in between here you have sort of thin walls of uh, gold or silver or something, and then the glass is poured into them and creates sort of a mosaic effect. Remember we talked about mosaics last time, where mosaics are bits of glass or rock that's put together to create a picture. Here they're actually taking liquid glass and pouring it into these little areas that have been created using gold, uh, iron, things like that. Uh, and of course they do a lot of work with, uh, with gold, bronze, silver. Uh, but again, most of the artifacts tend to be small, everyday things. This is a buckle that a chieftain would have worn. Uh, uh, it's a relic from this time period. It's a gold buckle. And it's again very ornate. And you start to see some of the patterns that are typical of this time too. This sort of interweaving um, pattern is something that's very typical of the medieval period. Uh, the use of, of crosses. You'll find a, a number of pieces that have crosses in them, but they're kind of interwoven, kind of interlaced. Almost like the uh, chain that you, the chain mail that you might see on a, uh, a knight. It's interwoven, and so their artistry looks like that. But again, they tend to be small works of art that are used. As we mentioned, in terms of architecture, you have the uh, churches, you have castles. Up in the uh, left-hand corner it would be a castle. Uh, on the right hand would be a, a church. And much like cloisonne, you have the development of stained glass, the technique of using stained glass to create an image or a picture. And stained glass, in a sense, is, is sort of like a mosaic, except that you're using clear glass separated by leading that separates the pieces, and then they can create a picture from that. So you're starting to see, in terms of architecture, again, this stained glass coming into play, particularly in churches. Again, because of the Christian influence, uh, a lot of the art uh, reflects Christian stories, Christian ideas and ideals. Okay, that's sort of the early Middle Ages. The latter part of this is what we call the High Middle Ages, roughly 1000 to 1300. And this becomes a time of empires, of conquests, and of course the Crusades. Um, have any of you seen the, the movie that came out on the Crusades this past fall? Uh, it sort of tells the story. What's that? 
Yeah, Kingdom of Heaven. I think you can actually rent it now in the in the video stores. It's it's a powerful movie, but it really gives a pretty good portrayal of what the Crusades was like. It gives you an idea of the the sense of what they felt was their mission, the Christians that were going on these Crusades, and of course the the fact that it, it wasn't successful, um, that they had problems, and it turned out to be in fact the time of really looting, rather than spreading Christianity. They uh, it, it ended up attracting people who were not very Christian at all. And in fact, were there just to sort of loot other towns and, and uh, as they uh, defeated other groups of people. Um, we've already mentioned Charlemagne. He was sort of credited first with spreading the Holy Roman Empire. But you also have this group of people that many of us in the Midwest are descended from, the Vikings, uh, who are living up in the Scandinavian countries. And these are these are people that are, are somewhat nomadic, they're traveling, but primarily by sea. So they're visiting in the year 1000, of course, where do they go? As far as where? Who really discovered America? The Vikings, yeah. I mean, we have artifacts that show that uh, as, as early as 1000, they were on the coast of Newfoundland up in North America. Not really, it's not America as we know it today, really, of course, but, but they sailed uh, Iceland, Greenland, all the way over to Newfoundland, Northern America, basically, and had settlements there. And, of course, even closer by then, if you go across the ocean, you have Britain, you have England, you have France, you know, today, what we consider France and England. And so you have these Vikings that are settling in these places in Europe. And these Vikings are known as uh, Nordmen, Northmen, um, and eventually we talk about Normandy being an area in Britain, in France, uh, which is settled really by Vikings. And if you remember your history, we have the famous Norman Conquest, which takes place in 1066, which again creates a stabilizing, um, sort of a unifying effect in northern uh, France and in, in, in Great Britain, and it really brings feudalism, this idea of feudalism, as a structure of government or a structure of society uh, to that part of the world. Well, meanwhile, um, the Christian Crusades are going. They're, they're going into the southern Europe. They're going into places in Africa and, and wh wherever. And uh, the idea is to really spread uh, Christianity, and they want to really uh, get Jerusalem and sort of uh, revitalize Jerusalem, which of course is a holy city for Christians. Uh, but their attempts really fail. It doesn't work. They, they're not able to conquer these people. Um, and the Crusades go on for actually uh, several, several uh, hundreds of years. The Crusades happen, they die out, they're revisited again, and you have this whole series of Crusades that happen. But one of the things that does come out of the Crusades is that it establishes trade with these different peoples. And uh, we have this influence of trade and new trade routes and things that happens. And with it, of course, anytime you have cultures that are mixing and getting together, there's a sharing of, of the arts and the culture. So now you have new stories, new art that's developing as a result of the Crusades. Here you would see a typical uh, uh, painting or picture that uh, depicts the, the very bloody wars uh, from the Crusades. And again, these were, these were conquests done in the name of Christianity, but unfortunately, they were very unchristian-like, as we uh, know Christianity to actually be. But th the other thing that came out of this, in terms of a literary form, is the medieval romance. Because it, it, the stories, you know, like, mo like many wars that, that take place, there are stories that come out of the wars. You know, people come back and they tell the stories, oh... This is what it was like, and they talk about the exotic places they saw, uh, and oftentimes the stories are elaborated and, and you know, sort of built up a little bit. So out of these stories of the crusade begins a literary movement, if you will, a, a, a literary device, a um, series of different types of writings and stories, uh, which we call the medieval romance. And these really come out of the crusades. And these are tales of valor, of chivalry. These are tales of love. Uh, we have King Arthur and the knights, the rounds of the knights table come out of this. Uh, and there are Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. I mean, there are many, many stories that come out of this period that talk about the medieval romance. Uh, and oftentimes these knights are portrayed as, you know, on their way to the Crusades or coming back from the Crusades. And then these things happen. Um, you also have people that are traveling around the country telling these stories in sort of a poet, uh, poetry-like form, oftentimes singing them. 
And uh, these people are called troubadours. They really originate in France. It's a French word. But again, the, the poems, the songs that they're singing, these troubadours are singing, are romantic songs. They're medieval love songs, medieval romance songs, oftentimes tied to the conquests and some of the things that happened during the Crusades. So you have these troubadours that are going around singing these things. Um, you also have the establishment of uh, a, a new dramatic form, new drama. Um, these are the medieval morality plays, they're called. And these are primarily <coughs> religious literature that's attempting to retell some history, dealing again with, with Christian history. So you have the mystery plays. Uh, they're called mystery plays because they reveal the mystery of the religion, uh, particularly the, histrial, the historical side of it from the Bible. They retell b biblical stories. You have the miracle plays, which as the title might suggest, would reveal what kinds of stories? Miracles, miracles related to Christ. Yeah, the different miracles that he is said to have performed. So these plays dramatize uh, the life of Christ and the miracles that he performed as he spread his doctrine of Christianity. And then the morality plays. Of course, morality deals with what? Moral issues deal with what kinds of things? Right and wrong, right and wrong. yeah. So these are plays that uh, promote Christian beliefs of morality, of right and wrong, the Ten Commandments, uh, things like that. And out of this, you will, you'll have the development of a new literary style called the allegory, uh, which has been used ever since then, really. And these allegorical plays are plays that have one surface level to them. They have a story that they're told. But as you think about them and people talk about them, you, you realize that it's symbolic. There's, there's other deeper meanings that are being expressed here and discussed here. And one of the most famous of these plays is called Everyman, which tells the story of a common person who's traveling around and he runs into lots of things, so he's tempta various temptations and whatever. And of course, as you read the story, it, it has one sort of meaning. It's kind of an uh, interesting adventure story, if you will, of this person's adventure. But it has clearly uh, more significant religious connotations to it. So we have the development then of this allegorical uh, play. And again, since we're just kind of highlighting here, it's probably the other famous work that comes out of this period is Dante's work called The Divine Comedy. And it's a, it's a long, uh, a really sort of a long a poetic version that talks about heaven and hell uh, and a variety of things. But it's a, a very powerful story. Again, it's basically allegorical. So... The Crusades really never accomplished what it set out to from a political standpoint, but it does influence trade, and it really does influence uh, literature and humanities in terms of creating these stories that are the result of the Crusades. Let's talk a little bit about the architecture of this period. Um, and we've, we've touched on a little bit of this. Uh, so we talked a little bit about the Romanesque style, but two basic architectural styles come out of the Middle Ages. Um, the first one is the Romanesque style. This happens really between the years 1000 and 1150. As we mentioned, the spread of Christianity that's happening here, Christians really launch into this monastic revitalization. They want to revitalize their monasteries. They want to continue to make sure that uh, their ideas grow and that their experience and that uh, the influence grows and so they want to make sure that they're training people they're uh, bringing people into the monasteries into the uh, priesthoods into their religion uh, so they continue to have um, leaders and so as a result the christian church and their followers build a roughly a little over a thousand new churches at this time period spread all over mostly uh, what is sort of northern uh, <coughs> southern europe and this particular story, uh, I'm sorry, these particular churches uh, are the central part. They're, in a way, they're kind of like museums because what they're doing is they're housing some of the relics that are brought back from the Crusades. Because remember, the Crusades goes to the Holy Land. It go, they go to Jerusalem. They go to these places and they bring back relics. What, what are relics? Objects that were held in religious faith. 
Absolutely. A, a relic is any kind of an object that has some religious significance to it. Now, the question, of course, is always <clears throat> how authentic are these relics? Because these crusaders would bring back things that were said to be bits of the, of the cross that, that Jesus was crucified on, or the hair of a saint, or the clothing of a, of a very famous religious person. Even the shroud of Christ comes back. And these relics then are housed in these churches. These churches are built to house these relics so that people can come and venerate them, can come and celebrate uh, them. So the, their churches are really, bought, are, are really developed, in a sense, uh, sort of like museums, again, to help spread Christianity. And they extend all the way from France through Spain into Europe. And what happens then is you have this interesting movement called the pilgrimage, which occurs. And again, if you remember back into your high school days, perhaps you read uh, some of Chaucer's tales, which tell the stories of the pilgrimages. What was a pilgrimage? What was the object of a pilgrimage? Any kind of a pilgrimage, actually. Moving out to <coughs> new territory, settling. Um, it, it's, you're close. It's really not so much... St it's, it's tied very much to religion. It's not so much settling, though. You're right, they're, they're, they're going out. It's really, um, some would say, sort of the first form of tourism. Because what you're doing is you're taking a pilgrimage, you're taking a, 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 an adventure, you're taking a trip to a place that has religious significance. Uh, and, and all religions have these. Uh, you maybe have seen in the news recently they've had the pilgrimage to Mecca, which is one of the, of the great religious centers. And people come from all over the world to go to this religious place. So during this time period, you also have these pilgrimages where Christians, in this case we're talking about the Christianity, but Christians are traveling throughout France and Spain, sort of on a trip, if you will, and along the way they're visiting these Romanesque churches because what they want to do is see firsthand, maybe even touch if they can, some of these relics, because this brings them renewed faith, and it, uh, you know, uh, it helps them um, feel good about their religious beliefs. So you have uh, people going on these trips, uh, usually during the warm months, summer months, much like we would go on vacation to visit a national park or something, they're going to visit these uh, churches and these relics. So these are the pilgrimages that occur. And so you have these churches that are built using a Romanesque style, <clears throat> which means that they, they borrow the techniques from, from who? From the Romans. It's called Romanesque because they take the ideas of the arch. Remember we mentioned last time that the Romans were the first to develop this new architectural form. So they take the ideas of the arches, some of the domes that they use, they used the, what in Roman time was a public place. The basilica was in the, the public baths were public places. They borrow those architectural designs and incorporate them into the, these huge churches. And these are huge. And what's interesting, if you ever get a chance to, to travel to Europe, and maybe some of you have, you visit these churches, they're out in the middle of nowhere. They're out, they would be like having this huge church, um, you know, in, a, in stark weather or someplace, or maybe even Devil's Lake. I mean, they're huge. They're gigantic. And the first thought is, you know, why do you have this huge structure there? But it was to accommodate then thousands of travelers. Through the summer months, there would be thousands of people coming to these small locations to visit these relics. Uh, and so they built these churches as a result of that. Okay, so that's the Gothic style. I'm sorry, that was the, Ro the Romanesque style. Now, what happens a, a little bit later, towards the end of the, uh, you know, 12, uh, 13th century, or the 1200s, or into the 1300s, you have a development of the Gothic style, which is even more grandiose. <clears throat> and this Gothic style evolves, again, uh, as a result of having another over a thousand churches built, roughly 1170 to 1270, but it has its own unique style called the Gothic style. Um, you should also know that Many of these churches are, are actually cathedrals. Does anyone know what the difference between a cathedral and a church is? Does anyone know? <clears throat> it's definitely more elaborate, and it has. It's fancier. It's more elaborate. And why is it? Why is the cathedral more elaborate or fancier than the church? There's a, there's a religious significance here too. 
it is because of hierarchy. The cathedral was the base um, for their hierarchical leaders. I mean, the, you had to, it, the cathedra was the, called the chair, uh, that you would have your bishops, your cardinals. I mean, the, the hierarchy would actually reside in these places. So the cathedrals were larger and more elaborate for those reasons, because it, it represented the hierarchy of the church. And so as a result, this new architectural form includes these, these tall spires that go up into the sky, reaching towards the heavens. And of course, that's part of what they're representing, trying to touch the face of God, so to speak. Uh, you have arches now that instead of rounded, like the Roman arches, are pointed. They come to more of a point, and that's a very, again, characteristic style that's Gothic. Uh, huge stained glass windows, I mean, that go... Uh, that are several stories tall, like from, from top to bottom, huge stained glass windows. What they call a flying buttress. I think I've got some pictures of some of these things here. And the use of gargoyles. And, and gargoyles have been kind of interesting in, in more modern history because they've been woven into uh, stories, into fiction. Uh, you know what gargoyles are, do you? They're these sort of grotesque little creatures. Here would be an example of a gargoyle. And, uh, but they served a purpose on the um, Gothic cathedrals and churches. The gargoyles were grotesque forms, oftentimes beasts or grotesque humans, but they stood primarily at the corners. And what they were were the water spouts. As the rain came down off the roofs, uh, they would go to the corners and then the water would actually shoot out of the mouths of like this dragon you see here and these gargoyles. And they were created in these uh, grotesque shapes and things because the idea was that they would scare off then evil spirits. They would, it would keep evil spirits evil from entering the church. They were sort of on guard. But this is a great uh, uh, picture of what a, a, a Gothic cathedral might look like. Again, you'll notice that the arches are much more po uh, pointed. You see in this example here, tall spires, very tall spires. You have a cross section, of course, which represents the Christian cross, which is part of the design of the cathedrals. These things that are holding them up are called flying buttresses. The problem that the architects found with these pointed, pointed arches is that they're much more elegant looking, but they're not as what? They're not as sturdy. They're not as strong. The Roman arch is a much stronger architectural form. So in order for them to build these high spires and to build up on top of them, they had to provide additional support. And that's what these flying buttresses do. They help hold the walls and support the walls. And it becomes then uh, out of necessity that they build them, but it also becomes part of the architectural form to have these flying buttresses. So you have the Romanesque style of architecture and you have the Gothic style, which again continues into the Renaissance period and uh, into the period that we're going to be even talking about here shortly. Um, what other uh, contributions were there from the medieval, medieval period? There were other contributions such as the legal system. Trial by jury comes out of this time period. This concept that you, that you can be tried for a crime and judged only by your peers, not by some magistrate, not by some wealthy person or whatever, but you would be tried by a jury of your peers. That came out of this period. Uh, the development of universities was essential to this period. Interestingly enough, the first universities are almost identical to ours today. They were basically a set of liberal arts. This is where people would go to learn and to have training in the liberal arts. M math, science, art, music, and so on. But primarily, who were the people being trained in these universities? Not quite yet. Close. But, but this was, these were religious people. These were people that were training for religious service. These were the monks. And so you have universities that are tied to different systems like the Benedictine order and so on. So they begin, again, these are really developed by the church and then later become, as you suggest, more public. Public then later are allowed to be part of this and, and you have academics and scholars coming. But initially, it's uh, church-driven, uh, again, for the idea of training uh, people in the monastery, uh, for monastic training, uh, eventually in, 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 for the church. Um, you also have, for the first time, a new system of uh, music coming out of this period. Um, this is the first Western music, we should say here, because again, we're talking primarily about the Western humanities. The East 
has already developed some things like this, but this is the first form of a Western system of musical notation, a way of actually writing down music so it can be played over and over again. It's the first of using polyphony, uh, which of course poly, as we know, means many, phonic having to do with t tones or sound. So it's the first uh, time where you have more than one tone used in the creation of the music. Two or more lines of melody is what we call polyphony. And you have new techniques in counterpoint and the development of the motet, which is a music with words. It's a song, in other words. And so this was really very new. The Gregorian chants, of course, they chanted um, Christian you know, documents and things, uh, prayers and things. But now you're starting to have music that have words that are not just <coughs> religious. These are love songs that are coming out of this time period. So you have a really a, a tremendous development in terms of the music. And you have new instruments being used. Uh, the voice really uh, becomes considered an instrument uh, to itself. But you have stringed instruments now. Uh, all of the stringed instruments that we know today really come out of this time period. The lute is like a small guitar or mandolin. Uh, you have violins, different kinds of violins, different kinds of, of stringed instruments, different kinds of uh, harps, uh, flutes and recorders, uh, wind instruments come out of this time. And the use of drums uh, are used. And, and they're using these in combination to create, uh, create music, melodious music. So these are things that are very new to um, society at this time. And dancing becomes now not a religious or a ritualistic thing, but it actually becomes a social function. So if you remember, and you see these depicted oftentimes in uh, you know, uh, movies, we'll depict these. You know, if you remember your Romeo and Juliet, or you remember um, uh, A Knight's Tale, which is, I, I kind of like that movie. Uh, but you've got, you've got these courtly dances that are happening. Okay, dance becomes a social function now. It's no longer tied to a religious ceremony or a ritual. These would be examples of some of the kinds of instruments that come out of, um, of the, the Middle Ages. Okay, this is the last step. This is the last step to get, the, get us up to where we are today. <clears throat> now we have the Renaissance. And we already, you already mentioned that the Renaissance uh, is the word for rebirth. 1300 to 1600, 300 years is a tremendous development in uh, the humanities, in culture, really. You have a combination of reformation taking place, reforming. Uh, you have the rebirth of interest in the arts, particularly in the classical side of the arts. And you have technology taking us into what is really the modern era, the modern world, really. And as we know, it sort of begins here in terms of using technology. Uh, the Renaissance is said to, be a, to have begun in Italy. And it was an attempt by the people of that time to, to look back at the glories of Rome and Greece, to sort of revisit classicism, but to put a modern stamp on it. And it starts in Italy, and it'll spread north up into England over the next couple centuries, next couple hundred years. So it starts in the 1300s and goes all the way up into the 1600s. And it really has a uh, tremendous influence on shaping the arts and humanities, but also the political structures that we know of today, economic structures, and our cultural values. <clears throat> the idea of classical humanism. Remember, we've talked about this word before, humanities, humanism. What is the focus on humanism and humanistic things? People, yes, it's, it's the focus is on humanity. So now we start to, to move back again. Notice that throughout history, which is always fascinating, we kind of go in these cycles, right? Uh, during the Greece and Roman time, the emphasis was on humanism, the importance of the human individual, what we could do as humans. And then out of that eventually evolves a Christian movement where the focus is not so much on humans now, but it's on God. It's on something otherworldly. It's on supernatural things. And the focus is on a life hereafter. And we're figuring out how we can you know, get ourselves to, to live eternally in a, in a world of bliss and so forth. Well, now that's, that cycle is coming back again. And there's a, there's a reinterest in things that are really uh, based on the individual, on humans. And so we, we are re-looking uh, at the classical period of the Greco-Roman era. And so classical humanism describes this re-interest in these things. Um, Petrarch, the picture up here is a picture of Petrarch, who is considered sort of the father of humanism. 
again, he's a scholar, and he wants to look back again at, at the importance of our lives on a daily basis. This doesn't mean that he isn't a religious. He's still a religious man, but he says we need to do more than just not worry about today. Uh, we need to think about today. We need to look at how we can make an impact in our lives today. And so he really is the father of this. And uh, science becomes an important um, element at this time, too. Does anyone know what this uh, representation is here? Or does anyone recognize? That is Da Vinci. Yeah, Leonardo Da Vinci is sort of the quintessential uh, Renaissance man. He's a scientist. He's an artist. He's a poet. I mean, he has all these things that he excels at. Um, and one of the things, he was very much interested in the science. And so he does anatomical dissections to understand how the human body is put together. And he uses that scientific knowledge in his work, in his art, in his artistry. So this is a drawing from one of his uh, journals, his notebooks, in which he's looking at proportion and uh, how humans are uh, proportioned. Again, remember, the classics, uh, the Romans and the Greeks, were also interested in human proportion. So we ha we're really looking at that. Uh, so as I said, they, they bring this interest of science into the study of the natural world uh, and into the <coughs> representation of it. Now, they invent some new styles in terms of the artists. They invent some new things. This is the first time that we have art uh, where they can use techniques to create three-dimensional um, uh, sort of a, a, an image to us. Of course, it's not truly three-dimensional, but it appears to be three-dimensional. So they're able to use new lighting and shading techniques to create a very realistic art form. Up until this time, if we were to look at the paintings, look back at the paintings of the Middle Ages, they're very flat. They're very one-dimensional or two-dimensional. But the new techniques that are developed by people like da Vinci makes it possible to create new perspectives uh, in terms of three, uh, using three-dimensional objects. And their, their pictures are very lifelike, extremely lifelike. So this is part of the, the style that comes out of the Renaissance. New techniques in, in art. Um, portraiture, which is again a focus on representing individuals. Again, much like the classics. They really looked at the individual human and created sculptures and paintings that represented them. That's what these artists are doing. And some of the greatest names of, of all come out of this time period. These are names that most people would, would know. Leonardo da Vinci, Raphael, Michelangelo, Titian, Brunelleschi, uh, among many others. And the other important development in terms of art is the development of oil painting which, of course, aids them in creating these very realistic paintings. Now they've found a way to take oil and mix with this oil certain pigments. And this oil then can be put on a canvas, and it has a, a long life. That's why we can actually look at the, the masterworks of these people today, um, you know, some four or 500 years later. We can look at their works, and they're uh, still very vibrant. And, of course, famous ones. What's this one? Mona Lisa. I mean, worldwide people recognize that one. Does anyone recognize what this comes from? The Sistine Chapel. Michelangelo does this fantastic. Now, this is this is not using oil here. The, the Mona Lisa is oil painting. This is fresco. Remember, we talked about fresco, using plaster and then putting the, the pigments in the wet plaster. Uh, Michelangelo uh, was commissioned to do the Sistine Chapel, and it represents... <laughs> sort of the entire story of Genesis, so the creation here where God gives life to Adam. And all around this glorious ceiling, you have representations of different uh, stories of the Bible, Adam and Eve, Garden of Eden, and so on. This, it's, it's fascinating. But look at the forms again. These are human forms. It celebrates the human forms. These are, these are heroic in the way they're portrayed. God is a force to be reckoned with here. Look at Look at Adam. I mean, very virile. I mean, the, again, the, the detail in terms of perspective and um, um, dimension is important here. Um, this is Raphael. He is a painting, uh, painting called the, uh, the Philosophers, a famous painting that depicts some of the greatest minds, again, of, of Greece and Roman times. And this is a, so supposed to be Plato and the Socrates talking together here. Again, this is from a larger, uh, from a larger work. And, of course, the sculptures, again, some of the most famous sculptures this, of this time. This is David, the David of Michelangelo, just before he slews Goliath, David and Goliath, you know, the biblical story. 
But again, it's, a, it's just a monument to heroism. You can see the emotion that comes out of a sculpture like that. He's confident as he's going up to face this giant Goliath. These were, uh, express the attitudes, really, of the Renaissance, a tremendous uh, period of time. Okay, and as we wrap this up, a couple other things, too. Uh, Renaissance music. Music continues to develop along a secular form. Again, we're moving away from, or well, not away from, but I should say in addition to, in addition to the religious music, we have secular music. Secular means what? Worldly, yes, not tied to any particular religious belief, but it's more popular, more worldly. That's secular. So we have this secular music being de uh, developed, and because of the printing press, remember Gutenberg now, you know, we can't cover everything here, but in terms of scientific terms, Gutenberg has created the, the printing press, which now makes it possible to print sheet music. So people can, uh, can buy uh, this sheet music and learn these popular songs, like a madrigal that has many parts to it, and they can sing those. Um, the artists, both the, the visual artists and the music artists, are really concerned with putting their human feelings uh, in harmony with nature. So that's why you see these works as being very, they, have, they express a lot of emotion to them when you, when you view them, the artwork, and you listen to the music. They're putting these things into it. Uh, and we see the same thing happening in their architecture, which again goes back to a classical idea of harmony and balance and clarity. Some of the examples of the great architecture. Does anyone know where this is? Uh, no, it's not. It's a good guess, though. It's not a palace. Not parliament. It kind of looks like a parliament building, though. This is uh, St. Peter's in Rome. It's the Vatican. This is the, the church that's built at that time. But notice, it's interesting in your responses, because it looks very much like a public building, more so than a cathedral or a church, doesn't it? And again, this is the, going back to sort of that classic influence. So this is St. Peter's Church. The Pope is, resides here uh, in, in the Vatican in Rome. And these are the architects that look back towards the Roman style. You've got the, the columns and things here, but they've got the dome, um, and they're looking back to that style. Here's the, uh, the uh, famous... Uh, church in Florence, again, uh, reminiscent of uh, Greek and Roman style. But again, it's the idea of harmony and balance. Everything is balanced off, and harmony is part of that idea. Lastly, we need to touch on the reformations that take place, because you know that in addition to the huge explosion of the arts, it was also a time of upheaval, upheaval and uh, of change. It's a time of... Uh, dissatisfaction in, in many ways. Um, again, the cycle is starting to turn again now. And so you have Erasmus, who says, you know, we need to go back, and we, let's not forget the, our Christian documents, let's go back and look at Christian literature and texts. You have Martin Luther, who's unhappy with what? The Catholic Church. He's, what he sees happening, uh, he feels that in the Catholic Church you have a lot of indiscretions going on, uh, they're, they're, sell, they're selling uh, uh, free passes into heaven. They, they have all these illegal things going on. And he says, wait a minute, you know, I shouldn't have to, if I wanted to commune with my God, I shouldn't have to go through this hierarchical system that the Catholic Church has established. And so he breaks away from this. And he, he, he looks at a, a different uh, Christian belief, uh, which, which allows the individual, again, to sort of go directly to God, to pray directly to God without having to go through the, the channels that the Catholic Church has set up at this time. And so medieval Christendom, as we know it, is really challenged by Martin Luther and his followers. And if you look at this time period too, what else is happening in the world? Yeah, sure. Okay, was there slavery back in these times then? There's, there's slavery that happens, but, but not, not in the way that we think it, but... Uh, but yeah, but there's uh, d different areas of slavery happening. Drama is flourishing. Shakespeare, of course, is writing in the late 1500s. But what else is happening in terms of technology and things? Where are people expanding to and going to? Machinery. Machinery is allowing them new e new equipment, uh, like the compass. And the uh, astrolabe are allowing people to do to go where? 
overseas. So now, remember, we've been talking really about things in Europe. Now, with the, with the overseas travel, the, the compass and so forth, you have the great explorations taking place during this time period too. Who's, when did Columbus sail the ocean blue? 1492. When was the first colony uh, in uh, America established? Well, no, in America first. The Jamestown, you remember Jamestown? 1603, 1607, early 1600s now, we've got these explorers coming to and staying in America. They're colonizing America. So it, it's always interesting to think about what's happening, not just in Italy and in Europe, but now we've got uh, the world really growing as this exploration takes place. So this really, this, uh, this is really where we're starting now. Uh, this semester, where we, we've got the influence of these reformers, and this takes us into the 1600s, which will be our first look at the what is called the Baroque period. Okay, and that's what we'll start talking about on Thursday. So by now, you should have got that first chapter read in here, because we we assigned that last week. You should be at that point now, and we'll talk about that on Thursday.